conducted over 30 community meetings on the islands of Oahu, Maui, Kauai Island, uh, Hawaii Island, Lanai, Molokai, as well as in Mokuhonu, in cities like Salt Lake City, San Diego, Los Angeles, Seattle, Washington, D.C., as well as New York City. Over the past year, yeah, over the past year, over 3,000 people have participated in Aha Aloha Aina, in our model, our Kino model of self-governance and reaffirming our things. Okay. Now, we believe, both working with Kanaka and non Kanaka, we provide a true model of self-determination that is independent out of the, that is independent from the control of the settler state while we work toward our ultimate goal of independence from the oppressor settler state many of us are also on the front line of social justice issues fighting for the protection of our water to stop the desecration of our natural resources we fight for affordable housing for all people we fight for universal health care to increase our teachers' pay here in Hawaii. Fighting injustices done to our houseless Ohana and many other countless fights that not only improve the quality of life for Hawaiians, but for all people of Hawaii. Oh. Those who help to organize Aha are also lawyers, teachers, cultural practitioners, medical doctors, college professors, students, trade workers, bus drivers, community organizers, social workers, farmers, fishermen and women, nurses, bus drivers, musicians, kumuhula, graphic designers, hunters, engineers, journalists, poets, artists, and these are just the people that I know personally. There are many in our efforts that I don't know. And I don't know what they do to support their families. But I mahalo their selfless contributions to our Ahalo Haina. While we work toward our ultimate goal of independence from the oppressor center state, okay, we also understand that we need to fight and engage and protect our resources that are at stake right now. We invite you, those Kanaka and non-Kanaka who would like to get involved in Aha Aloha Aina, please go to www.ahaalohaaina.com. You can also get more information by going to our Aha Aloha Aina Facebook page or going to our Aha Aloha Aina YouTube. Mahalo. Mahalo. I mahalo each and every one of you. And I especially mahalo our enthused who are here tonight. That is something that I welcome. But I welcome your criticism with civility, with aloha, and with love. Sticking to the issues and leaving the personal caps on the side. I will let you know that we organized this to kill three myths, okay? That Hawaiian Kingdom men are violent. We are far from violent abusers. We are nurturers, we are fathers, we are caretakers of our ohana, of our kuwa'a, and of our mo'i. Okay? Two, we're gonna kill this once and forever, that independence people are ignorant, are stupid and uneducated. That is far from the truth. And tonight's forum, as well as our Aha Aina, is going to continue this prove that myth. And three, most importantly, a myth that we are going to kill once and forever, that Lahui Kanaka, or Hawaiian people, cannot gather in a room together and have differing opinions. No. And it be okay. No. I'm a hollow. I'm going to say who just fooled me right now. And I uh, mahalo her voice because that is the type of voice, inclusive voice, that we encourage at the Aha Lohaina. That is the type of voice that is a true example of self determination. I would like to thank you. So, uh, with that, we have, I want to thank some people first that are making this possible. You see, some of our speakers are being presented with Aha, Sister T. Henderson, that brought some Aha. Right, we have our Kiai, you see them in the red shirts. Okay, he knew us earlier. They blew the poo, you'll identify them in the red shirts. Our Kiai, or our protectors. 
there are those that are going to help us to hold the conduct of aloha so that we can continue to be successful in this meeting that we want. Okay? So I'm just going to um, next go over a few things of how we're going to like to hold ourselves, okay? As a community organizer, help to facilitate groups both big and small. And one of the things that we implement is called norms and agreements. These norms and agreements are very key because in each room is different dynamics. So we are going to come up with some norms and agreements. And we have some already prepared. I really just have one. But these norms and agreements is what we're going to hold ourselves and each other accountable to so that we can have all of our speakers present and have, most importantly, an hour of community Q&A from you guys, okay? That's what we want. We want to get there, okay? So, really, we all know that one of the, our, our, the only norms and agreements that I, I have is aloha kahi ike kahi, right? Love one another. Love one another. If we love one another, besides our differences of opinion, we can move forward. Now, I'd just like to open it up to the group. What is another norms and agreement that we can all hold ourselves to? Feel free to just share popcorn style. That means you just throw it out there. You can shout it out and I'll echo it up. Is there any norms and agreements that we would like to collectively hold ourselves together to make sure that we be respectful? Be respectful. Can we can we agree to being respectful? Another norms and agreement we want to hold ourselves to. Kapu Aloha. Can we hold ourselves to Kapu Aloha? No. Is there any norms and agreements that anybody else would like to contribute to this group before we move on? Can we please put our cell phones on vibrate or turn them off? Can we all agree to that? Yes. Vibrate or turn them off? I know, so busy our life. Put it on vibrate just for us. Yes, sir. Addressing your concern without weakness. Exactly. And I want to mahalo. This is my father, everybody. Apulu Iwani. He's not Kanako. He's not Moya. We brought But he's here to learn about it. And so I welcome him. Thank you, Dad. You know, we good? We good? Hi. With that said, I would like to then go over the agenda right now before I introduce the speakers, our moderator, and our facilitator, and we'll get into um, our, uh, our program. You can know? Okay. So, each speaker is going to be given five minutes to present, five minutes to present to the general public, to our community. Okay? Um, after the, each, the speaker's presentation, they will then immediately have one question to answer. And these questions have been prepared from our Aha Aloha Aina organizers. Because we helped to put the Hana into this meeting, there are some questions that we want to have to ask directly, okay? After that immediate question, and all the presenters have spoken and presented, and they've answered their questions, our goal is to have an hour of community Q&A, okay? You can know? Just by a round of applause, can we agree to that? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Woo. Thank you, Noe. I'm a hollow you guys for being very patient with us and our organizing group. This is the first time we've ever done something like this where we have opened it up to speakers. Um, we've done Aha Lohaina. Now with that said, I would like to um, introduce our speakers at this time. I'm just going to introduce them down the line from this way, from left to right, to, from my left to this right. Um, and then I'm going to introduce our moderators, our moderator and then our facilitator. And then the moderator will take over and they will control the moderation and they'll give the order of the speakers and then go on and so forth. You can know? So to my far left here, we have the uh, president of the Sovereign Council of Hawaiian Homestead Association, or known as Shaw, uh, Mrs. Robin Danner. 
To, uh, to her right um, is the president of the Council of Native Hawaiian Advancement, uh, Mrs. Michelle Kawahane. We, we invited uh, Governor, uh, former Governor John Waihe'e. Uh, he was on the, uh, not here. <laughs> um, and we are, um, we have asked and we um, have been, the invitation was accepted. Um, uh, from the Makalehua, which is a group of young Napio organizers, um, uh, Nate uh, uh, Davis, and a graduate from uh, UH Richardson School of Law, Davis Price. <laughs> and the uh, invitation was also, also uh, offered to Board of Trustee Peter Apo, um, and he's not here, and instead we also offered um, for invitation to uh, Ziriaki, who's also also part of Namakalehua, and he was a chief drafter of the Naya Puni uh, Constitution. <laughs> to, to my immediate right here, um, we have, um, I'm sorry, the Doctor of Philosophy in Indigenous Education. I'm sorry, very nervous here. My hero, then. Oh, all the people here, right? Um, from um, Dr. Kuhn Kahakalawa. <laughs> to her right, um, speaking on behalf of Ahalo Aina, the uh, uh, convener, uh, Dr. Kalama Niu. <laughs> to Kalama's right, um, good friend of mine, as well as uh, Kiai, you'll see him, uh, um, Mana Awakea. Kao Kahi Kanua. And to our immediate right, the far right, uh, international uh, lawyer and expert um, speaker in the United Nations, uh, Mrs. Milalani Trask. There's a lot of lot of honor that went into um, organizing such a diverse and well expert group of speakers. Um, so I want to uh, just mahalo all of our organizers out there that help that help this. Big mahalo to you guys. Big mahalo to all the people on the forum. Now at this time I'd like to identify our facilitator. Our facilitator in uh, Hawaii terms is somebody that helps to massage the conversation along, somebody that's well respected within our community that we can all collectively in, in regards to. Uh, I'd like to introduce from Molokani, Uncle Walter Ridley. And finally, our moderator for this evening, um, he's also a good friend of mine, entrepreneur, longtime advocate uh, for uh, the independence uh, movement, uh, also from right here in Kalihi, Ikaito Hasi. Hello. So my understanding is that the organizers were intending for uh, for two speakers from each side to to speak, and then to flip to the other side. Uh, so. Um, Zuriaki is not available today, but he was supposed to speak first. So, Davis, why don't you take his five minutes as well as your five minutes? Capacity as a participant in the uh, the Naio Puni Aha earlier this year. Um, so, little introduction. Uh, my Ohana is from 
this Pu'ak, Ahu Pu'ak Kali, by way of a country in Maui, the Kekapa'i Keka Ha'o and Paiwa Mohana. Um, and I am a graduate, not only of the law school, but of the Hawaiian Studies Kamak Center, Kamakuo Kalani Center for Hawaiian Studies at UH. <clears throat> and it is there that I kind of got my feet wet, kind of got tossed into the active, you know, the activism role um, alongside of many of the familiar faces I see in this room on numerous issues. It was also there that I recognized my pathway forward, which was to engage in policy. Um, I was always fascinated and always a student of our kingdom history growing up. And always raised a lot of questions about how things played out in the twists and turns that took place in that very tumultuous time. So I continued those studies. Um, and one thing that I recognized by Kuliana to me was to take on that policy role that was so critical in shaping the kingdom and our history, the future going forward from there. Uh, so what I recognized was that engagement was critical because I, I saw what how these did within our kingdom. Uh, they played a very significant role in policy making that eroded the rights of the native people for a very long time. They quickly. So I, I said, why can't we flip that on its head and do the same thing today? And then study history more and you see the labor movement of the 50s, from the 50s and 60s. Check, check. Where you had another way of movement and political engagement from the minorities, the workers, the disenfranchised, um, the underrepresented, exercising their voice and taking power. And I always question where was Hawaiians' role in all of these things? And there was Hawaiians engaged very much so at every level of this, but for some reason, the masses didn't seem to reap all the benefits. So as a student, I studied how can we get our people in mass to protect our land. My family was displaced. Unfortunately, a bunch of my great-great-great-grandfather's -great daughters married Holly, Holly's dad essentially swindled all the land from a country. Yeah. Hence why they ended up in Kali. So, how do we change these things? And how do we work with the system and utilize the tools that essentially that's all it is? To me, government is a tool. Whether it be kingdom law, state law, American law, international law, it's all a tool. And the thing that we, that I try to never forget in every step of participation that I engage in is that this is about the people and the Aina. For me, I gotta look past the kingdom history. It's a small window. We have a thousand years of history prior to that where the focus was people and Aina. And that is when our people flourished. People were surviving once the Westerners came. When the focus was people in Aina, they flourished. So how do we get back to that focus? How do we get that intertwined in every piece of policy that comes out of whatever government it is we're not participating? So that said, I engaged in the AHA, not as a supporter of federalism, not as a supporter of independence, but how do we get down to the facts? There's so many mistruths flying around in the air. How do we get down to the facts where people can stop? looking at each other as enemies on opposite sides of the battlefield, but to engage with each other. Because unless we galvanize, it's not going to be an answer. And it's going to be a very hard road forward. So I went in there thinking, I like to see all these different points of view and see if we can't find one common ground. My experience was, it was not the best experience. It wasn't, it's not the best process. By far, it was broken. That's another reason why I engaged. Um, and I respect everybody's position, you know, to not participate, to stay outside. Everybody has a role and it should be respected. And all of those rules are significant and important. For me, I went inside to try and see where everybody's perspective is coming from. And like I said, to, see, to, to find out if there was a common ground. Because another understanding I had was that something I learned through 
by schooling the people that I spoke to with, mentors, experts, was that there is no federal recognition or independence. It doesn't have to be exclusive of each other. It's two frameworks of law, self-determination, indigenous peoples, kingdom law, nationals, separate government. It doesn't have to be exclusive of each other. So why can't we move on the patch together simultaneously? And what I found in there was, no one could tell me that I was wrong, that it's one or the other. And I don't have a name drop, but significant legal experts, people that are highly respected on both sides, wouldn't give me a clear cut answer. So, that said, I'm on. Oh, you're finished, I'm Okay. So that said, um, Again, so to find common ground. Um, and what I found in there was a lot of hope and uh, that, that we can have very, very emotional, differing opinions and still come to a common ground and still respect each other's opinions. And that no matter what we choose, there is no clear cut choice that says, I'm going to shut you out if I go this way, or I'm going to shut you out if I go this way. There is nothing like that. Like I said, government is a tool. Law is fluid, subject to political will, political will determined by the people. As long as the people move together, can I stop them? Plain and simple. Plain and simple. So all the, all the bashing that goes on back and forth, all the all kingdom guys ignorant, veteran guys sellouts, it's got to stop. And I'm hoping, I participated with the young people in that room to try and, I guess, set an example from our generation that's kind of tired of that rhetoric, tired of the bashing. Yeah, we want to figure out a way forward. Call us idealistic, call us sellouts. If you talk to us, I think you find out that that's not the case. So, sooner or later, I think this next generation will take the reins. And we'll rock and roll, plain and simple, you know, and we're gonna do it together. I stood side by side along with other young people, but I'm Kahi, staunch kingdom advocate. I don't oppose him. I don't think he opposes me. You know, so it's all about how we go towards a path together. And we're not trying to miseducate or diseducate, I think. The independence discussions need to keep going. I think the work that's happening in the international arenas need to continue to happen. But that doesn't mean that because someone is working on a different platform or working within the framework of the state or the United States, that they oppose those guys. Or vice versa, it shouldn't be. And uh, so I'll close with that. I think there's, there's Q&A afterwards. That might be more helpful. But mahalo for having us here. And um, yeah, mahalo for inviting people. The question that I'd like to pose to you, Davis, and this actually might be a question that the three of you might be interested in responding to, it, is that you know, we all woke up to a very different world yesterday, and given the, this great new world in which we uh, find ourselves, with a president-elect that has already said that he's going to pick you know, an, an oil executive to run the, the Environmental Protection Agency, um, what are the prospects for processes such as Mali El Tuni or federal recognition in general, given this incredibly rightward change in U.S. politics? How long do we have to answer it? I'll ask it too. Check, check. Um, quick response. If there's ever been a time that we need to do exactly what I just said. Yeah. Now is the time. Simple as that. Our natural resources, very much so, are going to be under assault. Um, probably more so on the mainland, on the continent than here. At first, we, I don't know. Who knows where they let you But if there's ever been a time that we need to galvanize, raise our voice, 
love, all of what we stand together is not very right? much. So, but I don't think federal recognition, uh, to me, is putting a cart before the horse. Federal recognition not going to solve the problem. The people can solve the problem. My response to that question would be that uh, I have confidence that we are a resilient people. We have been. Uh, this will. This is one president. We will have another president and another president that doesn't change uh, what we fight for uh, to better the conditions for ourselves. So. Every administration comes with pluses and minuses, as this one will, uh, so we work harder. Uh, but I also believe that there is so much work to do here at home first. We don't need to talk about recognition without first having a government. We should focus on standing up the government that must be recognized or should, could be recognized someday or another. Um, but right now, there is nothing for the federal government to recognize because we have not stood up a native Hawaiian government. So we're going to pass the mic now on to Dr. Mambalau. And that's how I'm going to um, address you today and talk about what we believe is what we need to do as Hawaiian, which is simple, to akanaka. Kua kanaka means to stand as a Hawaiian, to live as a Hawaiian, and to be a Hawaiian. And on a day-to-day -day basis, it's real simple. You know, we live the values that the Olelo no Eau tell us to live like. We practice our own traditions that we learn from our Kumo. We use Hawaiian as the preferred mode of, of, of communication if we can. If we cannot, we talk Pidgin, that's all right. We perpetuate the mindset of our kupuna as a way of life. Now, what was the mindset of my kupuna, my grandpa, born and raised in Kalihi, he and his parents, they were for independence. In fact, in 1897, 90% of everybody in Hawaii was for independence. Fast forward to 2014, I went to Keaukaha, because I'm from the big island, 100% of the Hawaiians there were for independence. So nothing has really changed. However, when you read this palapala that they're supposed to be using to, to define who we are, they said, oh, there were general comments, both supporting and opposing. Full lie! 100% of the people were against it, and here we get this of supporting and opposing stuff. Um, moreover, this, this Manawa continues to be misrepresented. I got this letter from Maisie, not that I'm Purdue and her or anything, but I got the letter just so happened yesterday from Maisie, and it says the final rule follows extensive, passionate comments. The comments was do not create a rule. That doesn't follow making what, was, what we told them to do. And so the promises are totally heva and incorrect. They're saying that many Native Hawaiians contend that their community's opportunities to thrive would be significantly bolstered if we became an American tribe. Yeah. And they claim that these formal government-to-government -government relationships between the Indians and the U.S. government are enormously beneficial to Native Americans. Now let's look at the Native American reality. Poverty has prevailed on preservation. Yeah. Highest poverty and unemployment rates in the nation. Yeah. As far as education, which is my kind of background, disproportionately underachieving 
dropout rate twice the national average. So, you know, for, as an educator, what are the benefits of federal recognition? Well, we have two, well, well, two options. First of all, neither these procedures nor NAGPRA mentions one word about education. However, the top 13 countries in the world in education all make sure that in their constitution it talks about the importance of the right of education because that's how we establish a culture of education where education is valued. And so, right now with federal recognition we have two options. Everything stays the way it does and education stays under the state. And we know that the Department of Education has failed our 70,000 KT and not just this generation but the one before and the one before miserably. The other option, kind of like back with that, would be to create new schools like Hawaiian versions of EIA schools. And let me tell you, I'm in Indian country. You wouldn't want to attend for your kids to attend EIA schools. So, but what are the possibilities of independence? And for that now, we need to look at the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which is an important standard that was set for the treatment of indigenous people. Now, that was uh, voted in in 2007 by 144 states, but not the United States. So that means they're not in favor of this. And so um, they, uh, again, the procedures, zero reference to this, to this most important document for indigenous people, even though it was signed into law by President Obama. Uh, Article 3, right to self-determination. Article 4, 8, right not to be forced to assimilate, which is happening right now. And then most importantly for me, right to set up and manage our own schools and education system. That can only happen under independence, not in, under being under any kind of a federal Indian kind of policy. And, uh, oh, wow. and so we have a long history of quality education. We had the first public school system west of the Rockies and we still believe in education. 1997, the, the Native Hawaiian Education Council calls for the establishment of a Hawaiian system of education. Today, we're working on a uh, eco air, eco diversity education with Aloha. We're moving forward and we're excited about that movement. Uh, we're working towards decolonization. The time is now to make go into the next step, which is to resist meaningfully and actively to create to uh, to restore our practices and to go back to doing the things that will work for us. Mahalo. The question for Dr. Kamakalama is, right now, Native Hawaiian youth, actually, uh, we represent, our youth represent a significant percentage of the Department of Education public schools, something like 25 or 26 percent, with Filipinos being another 25 percent. Uh, what do you think we should be doing now? I think we've tried everything we can. Uh, personally, I know I have. I tried to do TP a good DOE teacher. I tried to have a school within a school. I tried to have a school outside, like a charter school. The reality is the Department of Education is mired in institutionalized racism. And for the first time, they are actually talking about it. So HSTA is talking institutionalized racism. And that needs to stop. You know, we cannot have 9% Japanese teachers and 27% uh, Hawaiian students, but only 9% Japanese stu uh, students and so little Hawaiian teachers, so that it's totally skewed. Um, so I, I really think the only thing that will work is for us to create our own system. We're already working on it, and we just need everybody to be part of that. If we, 70,000 parents, stood up and said we're not going to send our children to a school anymore that is known to be racist, then they got to do something. And they should give us the $600 million that they spend every year not educating Hawaiian students.
let us explain our own thing. favor for folks uh, just to help the rest of the speakers out. Can somebody get a phone and just put your timer and put it face it toward the speakers so that they know what the timing, uh, timing down is? That would be great and that will be easy for us so that we can actually just glance over to you and know how much time you have left. So Lahaina, I'm Dr. Klomo Kainaniho. I'm one of the people who are organizing the Halahainas throughout the islands. Next slide. So I think that one of the things that's really, you know, surprised a lot of people was that Trump was elected. Independence people are not surprised. A lot of them are realized that what has happened in the past is happening now. It's been happening for since the beginning of America has started. They have never done justice by indigenous people, and they have never. They, right now, they got this, we have a president that is the result of underestimating the American people, and then also underestimating the level of racism that's happening in the nation itself. Next slide. And I wanted to point out that part of it is because the American system is broken. And what they've done is, I'd like to do a little bit of an analogy of how they've, they've completely been disconnected from their own people, how it's been propagated to over here. And so one of the things that they did was, in 2011, they created a Kanayolu Balu uh, uh, Commission. And what they did was they didn't, they didn't ask our community, they just assigned it to them. Because they thought they knew better. Just like you know how the Democratic National Party thought they knew better and to put Hillary in charge? Next. So what they did is, without our consent, they kind of kept on, again, you have a WikiLeaks, you have all these things going on, where Hillary is like swindling the Democratic Convention, right? Then you have here trying to make things fit rather than actually getting true consent from the people. They rolled over these names, not tens of thousands of names from the Kanayolawala list over into this role. Next slide. And what we what they had was in 2016, 150 unelected Nayokuni participants created a constitution without really going out into the community. Next. And one of their first acts for the interest of expediency to get this constitution written within 10 days was to decide to not allow the community to resent the concerns. And as a result, eight Kanaka were arrested at the gates of this private country club simply for wanting to bring our concerns to the table. And my question is, is that a nation for our people? And right now, what we're looking at is a major land grab. We, our analysis is, and we don't all agree with this, but what they, what's the main reason why they want to do this? Why are they pushing it through? If you look at and study First Nations and how they have to spend all this time to get recognized as the DOI, they want to quiet the title. They want to quiet the land title, 1.8 million acres of seized land. And the only land that we have guaranteed right is Kohol Lobby. Are we going to live there? Can we live there as a people? Next. And the world, or this is not anything new. Back a couple of years ago, 2014, OPA itself put out this informational uh, uh, poster that said, if you do not sign up for this role, you threaten the rights of you, yourself, and all your descendants forevermore to be considered a Native Hawaiian. Okay? That's some really intense stuff. Okay, what, we're talking about 80% of our people not on this list. Next slide. So the question then becomes, in a step up a minute, is federal recognition a healthy form of government? As a doctor, I can go for miles about all of the different statistics that show that it has really failed the Native American people. Next slide. But really, for those of you who have been following and paying attention, during an administration that's supposedly friendly to Native Americans compared to what Trump is supposed to be, here we have Standing Rock Sioux standing up for clean drinking water for 12 million people. And this is a response, a military response where they attack unarmed Standing Rock Sioux 
with over-enthusiastic, like violent, militarized concussion grenade, mace, attack dogs. Next slide. And we're also looking at a president right now who completely denies that climate change is occurring. And we're, this is not just one person. This is a representation of American policy. While this was happening, again, somebody that's supposed to be one of the guys that are pushing for climate, uh, climate change preparation actually signed three pipelines through to allow this crude oil to go through the United States. He's not stopping it. He's continuing fossil fuels. Next slide. And the thing is right now, as people don't always really consider this an option, but this is something to think about. And it's not just for us. I show here, Hokela. There, right now, their islands are going underwater. And they're saying, we are not drowning, we are fighting. And our islands soon may rise, and we need to realize that there is a choice coming right now. And for those of you, as a scientist, as a physician, I am telling you that our people had sustainable resources, uh, sustainable systems in place. Next slide. And what we need to do is, ahaloha, Ina, next couple slides over. Next slide. This, look at all of our different sciences, and one of them is healthy systems of governance. And right now what we have over here, this is the Kalaimoku, our traditional form. This is what we should be basing on. This is our structure on ahaloha, Ina, and where everybody has a place. And that's what any pathway for. There's one thing I agree with. There's a lot of things to disagree, but if one thing that we definitely all agree on is that we need to come together, we need to unite. This is a very scary time for a lot of people, and we need to do it in a very powerful way, in a real way, in a way that's not false and manufactured, in a way that honors the work of every single person here. Mahalo. So I'm going to ask a hard question to you, which is the, the federal recognition process is more or less well understood. Um, what is the, the what is the complementary process for independence? Well, I think that there's a. I actually had, I wish I had known I had that question. I have a really great infographic flowchart of an independence that uh, it's a relatively complicated, but um, everybody sees it as like, oh. It's like, everyone's like, what's your plan? It's like, we got a plan. And part of that plan, though fundamentally, if you look at the United Nations, we, we definitely consult them about this process, and they said any government at its fundamental basis needs to start with building unity and education within the community. And that, is what we're doing right now. Ahaloha is going out without any without any state and federal monies. We are going out to the community and actually listening to them. You know, we don't always agree with some of the things that they're asking for. We, we're having a challenging time, okay? What happened when they had the halibis out there to educate people about what was happening with that? You know, because they weren't doing it. With all their millions of dollars, they didn't go out into our communities. So us, with zero budget, with only the aloha of our community, went out and we listened to the people. And they said, we need an offer our people. And we're like, gosh, we're broke. All of us over here are broke. What are we going to do? We can't afford to have two weeks and you know, even a month when we get together. So you know, we went to every community, said, any community out there that wants to be part of this aloha, Organizer, your community will go to you and we will come with you and we will listen to you. And out of that came this. Not everybody in Ahaloha Island is very excited about including everybody's voices here. But we are here because we need to start talking. There's one thing that we need to do is we need to start talking to each other. And there's a lot of there's a lot of times pointing back to how arrogant and how wonderful it's going back there. We feel like it's North Dakota again. Yeah, I just came back from North Dakota. I'm like, oh my god, it's like, you know. But that's the first thing that has to happen. The next thing that's moving along is that we need to build up international alliances. We need to go and we have to recognize first that we are an independent country and that we have leveraging that we can utilize throughout the world. That there are a lot of people throughout the world that really want to have a neutral country here rather than a military giant. And 
The other thing that I didn't really point out before, I've never really answered this question directly, but Rome fell from within. Empires rise and fall. Part of the plan is understanding that the United States have proven and they're showing that they are unable to care for even their own population. So it's time for the peoples throughout the world to unite in caring for the people where they are and to move away from this global domination that has been happening and has dominated and destroyed the planet. We need to move forward to a new future. Don't tell Donald Trump it's talking about Rome, he's not going to like it. So, before our next speaker, I just wanted to give uh, some respect to Robin Danner, because we haven't always agreed, and I think there's a lot of folks on both sides of this, these tables that have not agreed for many years, and it takes a lot of courage and aloha for your people to come to this kind of event. I want to say thank you personally. To Robin. So, Robin, you're up. Original question, or what did you want yeah, me to do? Your own, or, or, your own I'll give the presentation. Aloha, everybody. Aloha. Uh, my name is Robin Danner. I was born on the island of Hawaii. Grew up in Numalu, a little fishing village where my mom and her 12 brothers and sisters grew up. I, uh, I was raised fishing, uh, and then my parents were teachers, and uh, I spent a lot of time on the Indian reservations of the Navajo, the Hopi, the Apache, in their educational systems, and uh, my parents were then uh, part of the self-determination movement of, of the indigenous people of Alaska to free themselves from the Bureau of Indian Affairs educational system. So Kui might be speaking of it, but I actually witnessed the breaking down of a BIA school and the self-determination of, of, of a native people and my mother as a native Hawaiian wanted to be a part of that and they opened the first non-BIA high school and elementary school uh, in rural Alaska uh, to break the bonds of uh, wardship and, and for the last 40 years have operated their own education. So I don't think that our situation is uh, different. I think we all have different experiences. Um, I'm, a, I'm a banker by training. Uh, I want to congratulate the organizers, especially Haleni and Shane and others for this uh, gathering. I mean, when I saw the materials uh, presented and just the logistics of everything, I want to congratulate you on, uh, on a job well done uh, for tonight. It actually reminded me of about 20 years ago uh, when we were all part of, and still part of, Kalahui. And when Kalahui raised money from the federal government through the ANA program and funded hundreds of workshops under the leadership of uh, Millie Lani, uh, when we worked together, and then when I met Haleni and Shane was about almost 20 years ago, uh, they came on board with uh, Kalahui, and we worked on Project Hawaiian Justice, which was a Kalahui initiative uh, to understand and put forward one of the three rings of sovereignty that we learned so well uh, through the Kalahui work from, from, 19, from the 1980s. Uh, I didn't get started until 1993, uh, which was about federal acknowledgement, federal recognition. What I want to respond to is that we have got to stop mischaracterizations. We need to be in control of our own education. We need to be in control of our own businesses. We need to grow native-controlled businesses, our educational schools. The charter school movement and, all, and the indigenous education has been wildly successful. Uh, but the Native Hawaiian Education Council, for example, that, that Cruz spoke about, was not formed by the Kingdom of Hawaii was not formed by the state of Hawaii. It was legislated by the federal government, the Native Hawaiian Education Act. So, it, so my message with that is that we cannot be all for and all against. We as Hawaiians, given our history, given where our children are, given where our spouses are, given where incarceration is, 
We must take every tool. We must not deny ourselves, our elders, or the next generation of millennials any tool, whether that is a state tool, a federal tool, or an international tool. That is the reality. And what I have come here to tell you is that very strongly, one of the mistakes we are making because it's sexy, because it's easier, is that we think it's independence or a native government to government relationship with the United States. And we have got to stop selling that snake oil. It is not one or the other. It is both. No Hawaiian should be opposed to independence. It's in our DNA. And that is a pathway that must be traveled, traversed consistently. And it will take many generations. Because until the global power changes and the United States is no longer in charge of the UN, you can worship the UN. But that is the United States today. They are on the Security Council, they have veto power. That is the reality we live in today. So we keep the fire burning and the work that, that is being done on the international level, just as Indian people are doing. And we must grab hold of every tool. And federal recognition, again, is not a healthy government, young lady. Federal recognition is not a government. It is not a, a, a form of government. It is a relationship. The government is what we may choose. And so my message to our people is stop the mischaracterizations just because it's fun and it's sexy and it's cool to be Malcolm X for five minutes. We gotta do the hard work of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Both of them, our unborn, deserve our best minds, our best debates. And I tell you, coming from someone who has been demonized in front of my grandchildren, who has been demonized when I have Kanaka boys, we have got to stop it. So I am here to say, I love my people. I am Kanaka. And I will never disrespect another Kanaka that has a better idea or even a worse idea. I celebrate all of us. And I call on my, my brothers and sisters that are working hard at the front lines of independence, AO, you must do that. And I celebrate those that must work who brought the Native Hawaiian Education Act, who brought the Native Hawaiian Housing Block Grant through the federal system. Do not deny my children or my kupuna or my neighbors from affordable housing because we have a bone to pick about the global reality of the United States. It is neither evil nor a saint. You know this. And the final thing I have to say, on behalf of my family, on behalf of my nieces and nephews, and my uh, pupuna that are not only uh, Native Hawaiian, but that are Native American, I am tired of the mischaracterization of people discussing Indian issues of which you know nothing about. Federal recognition is not the cause of the terrible poverty, the, the alcoholism that plagues Indian country. It is no more the cause of that than it is the cause of our own abuse of alcohol and drugs. We don't even have federal recognition, so we can't blame federal recognition. In fact, if you know your history, and I'm sorry, when you know your history, American Indians suffered over 500 years of forced assimilation, of brutal murder, not even comparable to our own experience. So have a little respect. When I hear people say, I'm not an Indian, that tells me I'm speaking to someone that doesn't know that there are no Indians, does not know that the Navajo are not Indian, they are Navajo. The Comanche are not Indian, they are Comanche. Kanaka are Kanaka. Indian is a term of art, and to flip that word around as if it's offensive, 
is offensive to me, and I think we as Kanaka need to go back to our people, go back to the ways of our kupuna, that we do not disrespect another just because it makes us feel better or bigger. So I want to... So on behalf of my nieces and nephews, some of which who have left their own Aina because of some of you, 20-year-olds, 18-year-olds, that is not the people of my mother. And I think that I call on the kingdom, I call on the royal order here and now to implement what our elite created you for, protocol, proper behavior. I want our people on both sides to align with protocol. And my last closing is to make sure it's very clear. I am for a native-only government that is recognized by the state of Hawaii, the county of Kauai, the county of Maui, that is recognized by the United States of America, that is recognized by New Zealand, by the European Union, and so on. I am for a native-only government that is recognized by the United States. Okay? That is a native-only government. I am for the governance my people had before the short-lived term of the kingdom. We had 2,000 years of native-only sovereignty and governance. Number two, I am for independence of Hawaiian nationals, native and non-native. Those are two things. So I am for native governance and I am for independence. Okay, thank you. So, Mahalo Nui, I am for, I am not against. I am pro federal recognition and I am pro uh, Hawaiian independence. Mahalo. Michelle, why don't you go on with the presentation? So, Michelle Colony with the Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement. And first and foremost, I just want to share uh, about what CNHA is. Because I see lots of things about what we are and what we're not. And so we are uh, a Native Hawaiian nonprofit of over 150 uh, members locally here in the state and nationally. I see the time. Uh, I, uh, CNHA is 15 years old. Uh, we have been gathering. I heard. Uh, Aha Aloha Aina, talk about 30 gatherings. We have been gathering in our community for 15 years. We have been holding forums, educational symposiums, summits, uh, and hold an annual Native Hawaiian convention and have done so since our inception. We just celebrated last month uh, our 15th annual Native Hawaiian convention. Uh, so when I hear people say, you don't speak for me, I don't. I don't speak for you but I have a membership that I'm accountable for. You don't speak for me, and I don't speak for you. But we definitely convene our community, we speak to our members. Do all of our members support federal recognition? No. Skippy Iwani sits on my board, we have great debates, but he continues to come to my board. We work on housing, we work on Native Hawaiian education, we work on things that we can agree on. He does not agree with federal recognition, but he has not yet quit the board. He just re upped for another term. But we are unembarrassed, we are unapologetic for being supporters of federal recognition. The, did your DOI hearings have a lot of op opposition? Absolutely. Because we stayed home. We stayed out of that chaos where when we stood up, we got booed where my husband stood outside the cafeteria at Makikilo because he was watching on television and knew I was coming up and said, holy crap, I let her go there by herself. So we submitted 5,124 comments, actually answering the questions that the DOI was asking. And so when you get frustrated about whether they heard your voice or not, you have to answer the question being posed. The question was not whether or not you supported federal recognition. The question was, 
If you organize yourselves as a government, Hawaiians, how shall we, the federal government, know that it is you, the government that we should be recognizing? And we didn't really answer that question verbally. We said, go home, get out of here, aole DOI. We didn't answer the question. And so, yes, we have supported federal recognition. We will continue to support federal recognition. Uh, some people agree with Kana'i Oluwalu, some people don't. Some people have uh, a bad taste in their mouth that the names got transferred. It's like any other vote. If you don't want to show up and cast your vote to ratify that constitution, you don't need to. But some of us want federal recognition. Not recognition that says, I am Hawaiian. Recognition that the government says, we recognize you as a government. There are lots of things that we want that are the same. But right now, the work that CNHA is focused on is really about ratification of the document. If you don't like the draft constitution, vote it down. The constitution doesn't guarantee federal recognition. The constitution lays forward before you to decide on a unicameral democracy. That is the form of government. The Constitution does not say federal recognition. That is a relationship, as Robin explained. The draft Constitution that will come before our people really asks you, do you support the unicameral democracy that is laid out in that document? It doesn't ask you federal recognition or independence. That is a relationship that your government may choose to have, but first we have to stand up that government. And so CNHA right now will continue to focus on education so that we, in hopes of getting to some kind of understanding, will our people vote that up or down? And if we vote it down, then we start again. So that is where we're at. I want to be clear about uh, CNHA's position. I have four seconds, so I'm going to end there and take your question. Ole <laughs> Hekeki Lele aku bau yo aku kali ini ikut palama, hele kula nui mak, hele ki kula mak kau meh meh. Puka bau mak mak kau ikut dua kau kani ehiku, mak ki kula kau meh meh mak palama. Kau mau aku ki kula nui mana? Lo aku upal palama leila nak kau lelaku ini. Bau, ya. Kau kau anak bau ikhaya meh atau kau ini anak ikhaya. Walau walau ia kiat walau kita hele pula ana, ame kaya amalong ko kela. Walau hele way kapula ana lewok pana, makai kiu mi kumai bakan ibu kumaha. Maya mana ba ale lo ake kahi pula kaya puni, mahape aku ya mahape. Pula ana lewok buka pau, ho iwa ina mahaule, ho iwa ya aku ka stars bingo banner apel aku. Ale ko mau makui ai kela, ale ko mau makui ai kela. Puka bau mereka pun anak leh, ko oleh laku itu ko orang yang uji pula, aku ni, aku malah, alen, noh aku makin pula kembali, ko mau jawab mak oleh orang lagi, aku kau mak tu hana, alu aku pula, eh leh, anu leh ini laku, ini laku, ini laku, ini noke noke ini noke, kuliah, ahe bai kau bai, alaila, lo aku bawa, eh leh pula bau, makin pula kau puni. Kehidupan mama kita hilang. 
Aku ia mau maka ulang aku pergi Aku kira Kenu ya kau hali kula anak Mereka mesti kula kamali i ai ke papa eono Ali bau ulang aku pergi maka meha-meha Oi ali ai ia maka lama Kau kamu anak maka Maka papa ulang aku pergi Kau kula kie kie ai ia Ola lo bai. Kula nui, ola lo bai. O ka uhana he kumu ba ka puna na leo, no e ba ka hiki, ola lo bai. No le le ka puni po wala he ola lo bai ko le no. Ah, moloko ka ola lo bai no ake kai ano kwa na ike. Ah, ho pa ya kukulu ya ko kwa na ike mau ko ola lo. No le la. O ke ano ko no ano ana, o ke ano ka mo hana, ko ku ana ma mau na ke pela ku. He ho pena ke la o ke ano na i ko ola lo. He ho pena ke la o ke ano o ia Ma ke kahi ano i kokoko i kokoke i ke ano i ke ano i ke ano i ao ia i kokako ma kukuna A ale like loa A ale loa like a ka ma loko o ke la Loa ka hua Loa ka hua A ka ale pau ma leila No leila No u oia ke ano A ale ka ko noi A ale ka ko u kali a ha abia mai kai pala pala Aye ke ea maanei, maloko ka kou maanei, maanei Aina ahe ea maanei, ale ku o koa maanei, mea ole ka pala pala Mea ole ka ole lo ake kaikana ka ike ma kou ya boe Kono ka kou iki ya ka kou iho No leila, ea, oye ko umake make O bau ma kou kou ike ea manawa, ho iho i mai A ka, ike le a bau ma kou manawa like, a ale ma kou kou ka kou ako A ale no ka kou ke la hepa Loko mea, ho ane lika ia, ka kou pa ka hiapa o. Ina ale ka kou ole loho wai, ho ane lika ia. Ma loko o kou ole loho wai iana, ho ane lika nui ia kou. Aka, lo ake kahi ka hua ke kai. O ke ano o kou ka hua, ua like no me ke aali, a ahe mea nana e kula ia, ahe mea nana e ka wani ke ia ka hua. Ua eme, ua malu, ua paa. A imi ana, e imi ana A ahe wa e kaua i ka imi No leila A ahe kako imi i ke ala mahalahi A ahe kako imi i ke ala viki viki No kumea, o waele mua i e ke ala ya Nane i waele mua i ke ala, maapi mai mako na po kiki Wa ho i ke kako mo kubune ya kako i ke ala E hele ya i le Ho hele ka papai, hele kako I'll do it in English. Do you favor an education system for Hawaii Kemana in which everyone would learn a lot of Hawaii? Aye. 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 Anak aku anak yang kaya nak hokan. Anak ini sibuk disrespectful. Akai na ini nak aku hikir. Oya kau pilih dia. Oya tekulah nak aku aku. Pono ya hok pono pono pocket dia kira. Pono ya hok pono pono pocket dia kira. Aku tak. Ah, nolila. Ini nak aku hikir. Oh, he 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 ha abi nak kaya. He ha abi nak kaya. Ku ea na ke kai ko ola lo hawaii ana ma hawaii ke ingia na ka ku ike ea no hawaii Te tiri kia te ba A oia te kula na ko ka ku ko e Ale no ka ku ka hewa A ka pona e Ko ona a wau ia ka ku A ka ko o wau I ke awa no ke ala me ke a ko e ka ola lo hawaii Ka ka mea O ka ola lo ke ka a o ka maori Oia ka mea ho o paa ne a ka ku A E li me ka u Wa ea ve wa maru wa paa E mihi ke ia A ka O ko u pono ke ia O ko ka pou pono ke ia Ale i pau. The synopsis of what was said was that Kahokahi and many others who were schooled in our schools that were based in our language and our culture. This is a demonstration of the great divide that could potentially continue to be that divide or to turn around and be that which unites us. Yeah.
And so the, the crux of what was said is that we have a, a new and younger generation that has been armed and prepared with all the very basic fundamentals, the rudimentary understandings of what it means to be Kanaka from our own language perspective and, and therefore with no disrespect to any of our people who are not fluent in our mother tongue but merely serving as an example it is from this foundation and it is from this N not only a place of a mind but a heart and spirit that our next generations base not only the understandings but the arguments and, and that which our young generation will advocate for. And that is as, as short and sweet as I can keep it. He has said that our young people are now, we, we, we have done this, those of us, all of us in this room who have supported Hawaiian education. We have all supported our next generation to be very, very different from that which our Hawaiians who have become very, very comfortable and very assimilated with into the American way of life through no fault of our own. But this is, this is what we are now faced with. This is actually our greatest resource and that is our future generation. without the involvement of our people or the education. The good news is that yesterday, President-elect Trump put a hold on all federal positions from Sally Jewell all the way down to Mr. Stanford Enamoto, who will not be in charge of the Office of the I never thought I would be glad to say anything about President-elect Trump, but I believe that Trump has trumped the DOI rule and it will be DOA rather than DOI. There's no way we can go through 172 pages in five minutes. What I wanted to say was just a few points, four points. Number one, why are we talking about a federal rule for federal recognition? What is the purpose of this thing? It didn't come from Hawaii, it came down a few years ago. Well, if you didn't read, the 172 pages, you might have missed what's on page 59,114. If you read page 59,114, it tells you why we're doing this. We're doing this because some Hawaiians want to exercise inherent sovereign powers so that they can, quote, facilitate the implementation of programs and services that Congress creates specifically to benefit Native Hawaiians. The purpose of the rule is not to give to our people self-determination, but to facilitate the ability of a few to gain sole control of the congressional funding and programs. Get away from you. Read what is in the paper, because what you're being told is not the truth. Point number two, this process, point number two, this process does not give our people the right of self-determination under international law. The right of self-determination is the right of all peoples with an S. It's a collective right of Hawaiians 
to determine our political status. What shall be the nation that we shall create, that we shall be citizens of? And by virtue of that right to freely pursue our cultural, economic, and social development, our ability to develop our own economic system, to lay taxes, to raise revenues, to tax others who work on our land, to build housing, to build clinics, to put up schools. This is the definition of social development. What is the purpose of this? The purpose is to facilitate receiving government programs from the Congress, not to allow us to form a nation. Point number three, this is not federal recognition under the current federal policy. If you go back and look up President Ronald Reagan, federal recognition of self-determination, you'll find the statement that President Reagan, a Republican, put on the record. Reagan came out and said it's time for America to stop treating Indians like wards. It's time to give them their trust lands and empower them so that they can manage their own affairs, return to them their lands, territories, and resources. This is an excuse being called federal recognition, but if you read the 172 pages, you'll see that it says that the Hawaiian nation will never have any trust lands. All trust lands held by the state remain with the state. All those held by the federal government remain with the federal government. The only exception for the Hawaiian nation is Koho'olawe, the bombing target, littered with live bombs, no homes, no clinics, no schools for our children. That is what it says. But you didn't have the chance to read it, and no one pushing it is going to explain it to you. The Indian nations have powers the Hawaiian nations will never have. If you read the jurisdictional statutes of the United States, it says that when American Indians and their governments wish to challenge the United States, they go to the federal district court and the United States must respond. Well, if you read what they're saying for our nation, you can try to sue the federal government, but the federal government has sovereign immunity so they don't have to answer. That is not federal recognition that the American Indians have, not that we are Indians. One of the things that greatly concerns me is that this process requires that we relinquish our claims from the overthrow of our independent kingdom. That we relinquish it. We will never be able to retain back what was taken. And I'm very concerned with the deliberate uh, program of misinformation coming from people like Zuriaki saying that there is no human right to restitution. This is a lie. A lie. Leave me alone. If you allow them to go on, you sit down. And not in 1997, the United Nations expert and special rapporteur on the human right of restitution wrote a report telling us what our right was. And three years later, the United Nations Committee to Eliminate Racial Discrimination, a binding treaty on the United States, issued this statement. The committee urges all states, including America, to recognize and protect the rights of indigenous peoples to own, develop, control, and use their communal lands, territories, and resources where they are deprived of their lands, territories traditionally owned or otherwise inhabited to return to them their lands and territories. And only when this is not possible for factual reasons should the right of restitution be substituted with the right of compensation. And upon that occurring, compensation shall be paid in the form of land and territories. We have a right to be restored. Our country, our nation, our right to be self evident These are our human rights. America didn't like it. This we passed in 1997. The declaration passed in 2007. America refused to sign. 2008, America came to the CERT committee and said we will not obey the declaration 
It's not a binding treaty, and America didn't sign it. America doesn't recognize Hawaiians, only Indians. And the third committee said back to America, we note your comment. We decide, however, to use this law to interpret your American binding human rights treaties. So you see, America was struck down in 2008. This we must oppose, election or not. We're gonna oppose this. But I believe that President-elect Donald Trump will do this for us. Yes. And already I have sent to President-elect Donald Trump a request to ensure that we do not have Mr. Stanford Enomoto taking over the Office of Hawaiian Relations. Nation building, I believe in it. If you want to see a real constitution written by Hawaiians, after 53 workshops, four times, 212 workshops, look at the constitution of Kalahui, Hawaii. We didn't forget education and housing like they did over there. This is a federal ruse. We need to oppose it. And thank Akua Mahalo Ke Akua that Donald Trump is here. I can tell you he will not allow this one to proceed and be the show. announcement on the CRV ZAF540. Your lights are on. Lights are on right up there. So on the CRV ZAF540. Okay. So I believe we're going to have this microphone is available for people to line up and ask questions to the panel. But why don't we start off with while people are lining up. Um, Robin, I'd like you to respond please, to the question about Donald Trump and the right wing sort of in uh, U.S. politics. So the question was, what impact is Donald Trump? Is federal recognition Okay. What? Oh, is federal recognition dead? Oh, 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 oh. All right. Thank you. That's a great question, and it should be answered because there seems to be some misunderstanding. Um, but the federal rules promulgated by the Department of Interior were promulgated for the federal government to be their rules, number one. Number two, it took three years of opening of public hearings, public comments with the record open, three years to do 172 pages. On September, in September earlier this year, those rules were adopted. So, what's his name? Kaika, that's right. Ukaika, the Trump, the election of the president has no impact, no bearing on the DOI process. It's POW. In other words, what's there is a federal regulation that is written in Part 50, CFR Code of Federal Regulations 43. There is nothing for President Obama and there is pre nothing for uh, President-elect Trump to do. It's done. It was a three-year process. It exists. It sits there in, in the CFR and does not have to be accessed until Native Hawaiians, until our people want to establish a Native government, operate as a government, never even use the process. So I think there's some mis misnomer that uh, federal recognition the federal rules of the Department of Interior are not a land claims uh, settlement. There better not be any mention of land or deciding what lands will be there. The federal process was merely a process for the federal government itself to have regulations that it follows, not that we follow, but that it follows in order to extend acknowledgement to a native Hawaiian only government. And so that process, Ikaika, uh, was approved. The final regulation is in place. It will now sit there. Uh, it is not waiting for any federal action. It is not waiting for President Trump to do anything or for President Obama to do anything. It's dead in the water. It's dead in the water. 
Okay. We have our first question. No working. Yeah, it's on. It's on. Hello? Hello, Akaku. I am Kumori Morinui Kamehameha. My name is Lancelot Ha'ili Liki. I descend from Lone Kamakaiki, Eleiki, Yabe, Kalaniopu, Keiku Haupio. This is why I take this title of Kamehameha Eleiki. Dana, no disrespect to you, but you should stick to banking. You sound like an attorney over there. How many attorneys do we have in this house, Hawaiian attorneys? I mean, I need to pause. I we, we said earlier that our that part of our rules of engagement for tenants that we will be respectful to each other. So ad hominem attacks are not allowed. Okay. Please continue. I'd be respectful. Um, how many attorneys? Can you please do me a favor if you're an attorney? Can you please write a letter to Mr. Trump and ask him for redress for my kingdom and our people? Redress, very important word, very, very strong word that covers it all. Money, land, everything, the kingdom come back to us. That's all you need to do. Simple, mathematics. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Aloha. This is for our the federal recognition panel. In the federal recognition, if it passes, does the people of Hawaii acquiesce all of their sovereign rights to the U.S. in silent agreement? And what would that hold to our people if it happens to be acquiesced to the U.S.? The question has never been posed before a court. My interpretation is no, and here's why. You have 125 approximately acts of Congress that have benefited Native Hawaiians. Benefit, or however you want to characterize it, serve Native Hawaiians. You have homesteaders, you have 20,000 people on a homestead wait list, act of Congress. It's not getting to driver's license, paying taxes, and all those things, but just that alone, just Hawaiian programs that Hawaiians participated in, if we were ever to admit or say that that is acquiescence, the majority of our people have acquiesced. So, in my perception, no, it's all been under duress. And I think we have, if there's ever a court that's going to take that question, I think we have a solid argument. And no one's ever told me no. I'm Professor right. Williamson Chang, international law expert, I posed that same exact question for him at the OHA, multiple, at the AHA, multiple times. He told me, he never gave me a clear answer, publicly. So Privately, he told me no. It's a gray area. He told me no. Legal experts have told me no. So one of the clarifying things, I think it's a great question, uh, but one of the clarifying points, once again, that we have to frame is that there are two processes. So when you say acquiesce, the question really is, uh, I'm a homesteader, as Davis said, any scholarships that were taken under the Native Hawaiian Education Act, is that acquiescence? No. And then we have to remember the two. So the question you're asking really comes down to this. If you, uh, does the federal recognition a nation-to-nation -nation relationship domestically, not internationally, impact any opportunities we have on the international arena, which is a very separate path, and which is why I can say to you, I support both. I don't need to oppose one to the other. So to answer your question, the answer is no. Okay, I'd like to response to from this side. So we had, I guess we had two responses over there, and then we'll have two responses up here. So I'll, I'll just start off with one. And that is that um, when we're talking about acquiescing, we have members of public site of referendum. This is recognized ever, ever said that we will go under the plenary power of the United States. Plenary is absolute. 
absolute, by participating in this process and by saying that we're going to be part of this process, we're agreeing to go under the United States. We've never, our Kupon will never, ever agree to this. We have never, as a people, never done that. And internationally, and also morally, ethically, we stand to find the fact that our people have never acquiesced. We have never given up. We have never yielded our lands. We have never yielded our lands. And when you take a look at the, we have consulted the United Nations, and they look at the process, a couple of things happen. When you look at a nation, really truly international recognizing, you can't have just one race. That's a violation of the human rights. There have been countries that have tried to do this before, and they're not allowed for very good reason. But you can go to look at the wrong party, and the wrong party are the people who were affected by the overthrow. And those are descendants of the Kingdom of Hawaii. And those are all Kanaka, but there are also non-Kanaka as well. So that qualifies. That qualifies. So there is, we might disagree on the analysis of this, but we do know Native Americans. We're not the only people that, I won't pretend I'm the only person that knows and has extensive experience with Native American struggles. Because we have learned and walked together side by side because our struggles have been the same. Millie Lani here can share thousands of stories as well. I've been raised internationally supporting and fighting for other than side by side with indigenous people. So yes, we do understand this. Mahalo. But my answer was on the question was. proceed with you or without you. This is something that was fashioned by a few in Washington and imposed here with public hearings. Even the state legislature law said register 200,000. They spent $7 million from OHA, registered less than 20,000. And Mr. Price is saying he doesn't know any court that said that. But when the Judicial Watch took them to the District Court in Honolulu, the Na'iyaupuni disincorporated themselves. Then they went ahead, threw out the roll of 20,000. They never registered the 200,000. They threw out the roll of the people and said that they're going to write their own constitution without being elected by the people. What the rule says is that America is going to recognize only one nation under their rule. This is the rule. And once that nation gets recognized, they get all the kala from Congress. Congress will never recognize again another Hawaiian nation. This is in the DOI rules. So acquiesce. Um, do you have to sign up on any other various role commissions like Kanai Oluwala um, to vote no against the Nayakuni Constitution? Do you have to sign up for any other roles to vote no against the Nayakuni Constitution? Uh, there was a, actually, the Constitution that was crafted left it open to be determined. I, I don't have the language in front of me. I thought he was going to be here. It was left very broad, the language, as far as how the registration would take place. But it was very clear that all Hawaiians would be, event, would be eligible to vote. It didn't specify any specific registration process. And that was something that many of us went in there to fight for, so that we could make it broader than the previous Kanaiyo of the world, because we understood that that was limited. And we heard, we heard many people say, why that was problematic. So we wanted to open up other options for people to register. For example, one idea that came up, and nothing's been clear cut yet, nothing's been decided yet, was if you've ever registered for any Hawaiian scholarship, no matter at schools, my homelands, Koha, Arubike, whatever you had to prove Hawaiian ancestry, you could bring your documentation and go vote at a point place. That's, that was something that was being advocated for. Again, not decided. But 
that's the type of voices I was in that room. Um, so, that's your question. No, no, it's not, it's undecided. It's undecided. It's open. You may not have to, hopefully not, in my opinion. So, you guys don't know yet? Are you guys going to come to that conclusion? Or is it just, we don't know? It's going to you know, hopefully be decided soon. You know, I will, I will uh, have to agree with um, Dr. Jackson and that I feel like the federal recognition process and this nation building process that's been established is, is stalled. Yeah, but it's separate from the nation building process of just our people coming together and discussing like this how we're going to move forward and how we can build on that constitution, or in my opinion, even a California constitution which was incorporated. Wait, Ron, no wait. I'll give you a chance to respond. Yes, I'd like to. No, the Kalawi Constitution was written by elected representatives of Hawaiian peoples. It was copyrighted as well known because our Kupuna advised us, and one is right here, Black Eagle Ohuli, that the time would come when there would be pro federal Hawaiians who would try to take the Constitution and manipulate it into something else. Uh, you will never have the Palapa Constitution. If you do an educational process and bring uh, designated representatives from the community, you will have a good Constitution that will have many things that Palapa is having it. But you cannot, you cannot designate those from Boa, Na'iyakuni, the Shah, and CNAT, to lock themselves in a room and come out with a piece of constitution. That's as Kuhu Kamakamu was pointed out. How you guys wrote the constitution and forgot about educating the children? You never think about that, yeah? yeah that's right. <laughs> We've always been a people for life. A few weeks ago, I planted plants at Magenta Park. Uh, the system came in and removed all my fruiting plants. I stood there crying. The difference between all of you and my people, I give life. I bring life. And they removed life. The potatoes are still hanging in there, the sweet potatoes. I'm going back and planting them. Park up more potatoes. It's that simple to be Kanaka. Another thing that I want you to understand is the blessing of knowing who you are. And it's not to be having to decide this BS. Plain and simply, we're poor people. To meet Filippo Souza. I love Filippo, that name, Filippo Souza. He's a Portuguese that is held in there. All his 80 years here in Hawaii for our people, for his wife, for his children. I love Filippo. He's a perfect example of what will be the new Hawaii. Beyond the Pope, but also inclusive of those that are, are hanging in there. Where I'm getting confused as to is he not Kanaka? He is Kanaka Mori. So I have I have resorted to knowing that Lipo is a person that I look up to as much as he says, why are you the why are you that one person that supports me? What about Presto? I'm that important person. That's the difference. I am Pono, and I now know Filippo is Filippo No. And that's what we need to be, simply Filippo No. And those of you that are suffering with the different cancers that the United States has bestowed on our people, we need to enlarge Queen's Hospital to accommodate all of you. That's the problem. We need to be a multiple society. Once again, nothing's wrong with being a homogenous, especially when we are Pono, direct from God. Simple. No questions. 
no more discussions. Our power, our many. And Filippo, I honor you. <laughs> I like to pull some things into perspective. And one of the biggest problems I think we have that stems a lot of confusion is the terminologies, uh, the definitions that the US uses that we subscribe to, which we should. Number one is we made our self-determination while we were a kingdom. And it was reaffirmed at the court petition. So that which they are asking is for domestic or internal self-recognition. So it's a different uh, thing altogether. The same goes with uh, indigenous. We are not indigenous. Kawikioli established us as Aboriginal, which is Kanapa Maori. And we were recognized as an international country, independent and sovereign. So you cannot use their words because they forget to tell you what they're asking for. They're asking for domestic recognition. People use the words colonization. We are not colonized. We cannot be because we are recognized as an independent nation among the European nations. So you cannot use that word. There are many words that they throw out. You have to step out of that U.S. box and speak up as a Hawaiian Kingdom subject which I knew as a child when I was cognizant about things going on from age 8 that's been over, what, 60 years? 70? Who knows? I'm not counting anymore. <laughs> but the thing to, to remember is that you have to know who you are you have to speak as an equal to the United States not follow their uh, manifest destiny doctrines which they are imposing upon us. And so there's nothing wrong with those uh, who want to be uh, foreign Americans. But when you go into the federal recognition program, which we all know from the Akaka Bill, you cannot negotiate anything from the Hawaiian Kingdom. So you being Hawaiian Kingdom subjects, you must first renounce your citizenship to the Hawaiian Kingdom and formally naturalize to the United States to join that little tribe. And I think it should be mandated for all Um, Twitter and um, via email. So Josh is going to ask some of those questions. Um, there's a question that came in from our uh, hashtag AAA Forum 2016. Um, in the wake of in the wake of white America's apparent repudiation of ethnic, religious, sexual, and cultural tolerance in this election. Do you feel comfortable committing Do you feel comfortable committing our a continued, dependent, and acquiescent relationship with the United States? This is for Ron and Dan. You cut in and out a lot, so I'm going to try to paraphrase what I thought I heard. Before. I can repeat it. In the wake of white America's apparent repudiation of ethnic, religious, and sexual, and cultural tolerance in this election, 
Do you feel comfortable committing our law to a continued and acquiescent relationship with the United States? Well, first of all, no one is committing our law to anything. There, there are many initiatives, there are many different kingdom organizations, there are, you know, we were part of the law there were many odds. So that's first and foremost. But I think the heart of the, the person's question is with the, ele the uh, recent election, my question back to you would be, with the recent election, and the uh, description of the adjectives of what that election means to some folks in terms of using the terms of racism, et cetera. It was a tough election. But my question would be back to you, what does that mean? Acquiesce, does that mean I should pull my, my youngest son out of school? Do I turn in my driver's license? Do I, uh, you know, these kinds of things. That's the, that's the kind of question that is. And we live in the real world. Tomorrow, many of us are going to go to work. We're going to get in a car and drive it. We're going to take our kids to school, uh, etc. So the recent election doesn't um, make cause us to do anything different. That is to be uh, that is to be of a mind frame that someone else decides what we would do. So the Trump Clinton election doesn't freak me out. It's not going to change where my son's going to go to school, where my grandson is going to go to school. It doesn't change uh, how I get there. So, the, the, so I'm not acquiescing uh, to anything because of that election or any other election. There have been 45 presidents in the United States, and it hasn't caused any of us, and certainly not our law food, uh, to acquiesce to, to anything. Do we have an, uh, any other comments on the other side? Any comments on that question? Next question. Next question. when it comes to Aina. And so to me, I, I am not going to act against nothing. I'm Hawaiian and I will be Hawaiian until the day I die. And that's all I want to be. I don't want to be nothing else. Josh, are you going to ask another question? Yeah. All right. Well, I'll do it.